Hi, ciao Matteo. Hallo. Come Hello. Gu gu guten Abend. <laughs> okay. See, we, we thought we saw an interview with you and you were speaking Italian and you know what we were so it, it's just such a beautiful language speaking Italian so I, I, I wrote down this one sentence that's all Italian I can do uh, but I thought it was a good it's start the, uh, sera. that's a good start that's a good start <laughs> um, first of all hey thank you so much for taking the time um, it, it's just fantastic that we have you on our Wolfie's Talks um, I'm very excited to speak to you because um, you, you're really one of my favorite writers, the, the style you're writing. And I want to just acknowledge you for, for all the success you had in your career with uh, winning stages at all the Grand Tours. You won Paris Tours twice. Uh, you were in the team winning Dubai Tour. So you've been here a couple of times. So, and I like really the way you, you race. I, I, I have something, I have a spot in my heart for people riding classics, for people riding in an aggressive style. And I think you can... You can read races and you race in a certain way, which is very special in the peloton. That's, I think, why you stick out of the of the peloton for me quite quite a bit. Oh, thank you, thank you. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation. Also, uh, as a first uh, non-German in the Wolfis talk show. <laughs> and yeah, I'm really really keen to to hear your question and answer and and also answer to the to the fan question here. And yes. most of the, I, I don't know was the was the geographically. Peloton here, uh, mostly Dubai or mostly all around the world? I think now we're kind of reaching all around the world, but obviously Dubai as a place itself has a lot of people from all over the world. We have people from, from all over yeah, that's where true. cycling is around. From We have a lot of people from Europe, from UK, uh, Australia. I think our customer base is quite quite mixed. And as well, obviously, the, the interest of local riders over the past years has grown tremendously. So we have lots and lots of local people now uh, enjoying racing. And obviously, with all the cycle tracks, which you have seen, you have seen on Friday morning. You've been on the Friday morning ride. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you was... ever get out of bed so early to, to go for a bike no, ride? Or never, never, never. And then I, I did I did also, second day, I did also the Café Peloton ride. Yeah. And then I said, okay, that's enough. I go back on my holiday. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Too early for, for biking. No, but it was beautiful. I mean, you know, waking up in the morning and it's strange getting in the desert with this uh, humidity. And then you can see all the the skyline over the over the fog. It was quite it was quite nice. It was nice. Yes, I think people when they've never been in Dubai, they think, okay, where can you ride? And that's maybe one of the questions I'm I'm being asked the most is say, where do you ride and who's riding and stuff. But I think people here in Dubai, I think it's quite amazing that they that they see. And we feel uh, that the ride we do on Friday morning is very important for the community, and a lot of people enjoy this as their one of the highlights of the weekend to start the weekend to get out with like 120, 150 people. You've seen how many people were yeah. there and, and enjoyed, yeah? I think yeah, cycling yeah, no. was a real was major nice. sport. was nice, was nice. And, and also everyone is a, is a kind of a friend's ride more than uh, more than making a race, even if you guys make a race at a certain point. But, yes. but it, was a, it was a really nice experience and to see all the people chatting together. You can, you can find your friends, you can find new friends. Yes. And you can maybe also do some business uh, because you never know who's riding next to you. Yes. And and I think it's a really nice idea also to to share a passion the passion of cycling through through a bike ride on the on the weekend. I, I was racing on Friday. You didn't see it. I was trying to race you, but you didn't. Even yeah, but when, when you guys started racing, I was just <laughs> <laughs> I was in the North Racer Group. <laughs> I want to start maybe a little bit from from the history when you started racing. How, how was it? Who introduced you to cycling? And what are your first memories from uh, little Matteo on the bike and your first inspiration to get into the sport? Uh, actually, it was not an inspiration. It was a uh, 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 kind of need because uh, I, was, I, I don't know you can, if you can, maybe can see this one on the camera. So that was made when I was one and a half years old. Uh, kind of my three cycle. So I crashed and I basically opened my, my head more or less. And I was never really a big, uh, big technical bike rider. And next to my house, uh, the, the local team was training with the kids. And, um, and we were passing there with my father and I said, why not trying? So, so we went there, we asked uh, how, how it was working, uh, if I can start. And they said, okay, this is a little bike for you. And when you want to come, you come. And, and there is some races and this and that. So it just started like this. And from my memory, the first year was just, you know, uh, play more, more, than, more than a ride. Uh, it's it's like a bike school. You you do some gincanas where they where they teach you how to how to properly drive a bike, uh, and you do some little sprint uh, where you can understand how to 
how to sprint. Uh, and then the more you grow, the more they, they, they try to teach you how to stay in the wheel, uh, how, to, how to do this, how to do that. And it's more like a kind of a school. Uh, and then I think it was uh, every, so uh, if I don't get wrong, it's uh, three races per month. So three weekends, yes, and one no, more or less, or two yes, uh, one no, and whatever. Um, and basically it was a party. Uh, so you go out, uh, you have your uh, barbecue, and there is six uh, different categories for kids. Mm -hmm. So you have yes, uh, six races for, for, the, for the boys and six races for the girls. So it takes basically, basically the whole day. So we get there in the morning, uh, preparing all the, all the stuff for the food and et cetera, then watching the other boys race uh, or girls race and then play soccer, play something else. And then keep a lost time for your race, then you race, then you come back and you came, came back again playing soccer and et cetera. So that was, that was the youth cycling uh, that I got. Fantastic. Did you have anyone in your head when you were racing, like you were pretending to be another when you were a little boy, like you had maybe one racer you were really looking up to? Was there one in your in your era where you said, okay, one day I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be like him? You had somebody in your head and you were playing? Oh, not, not really, not really. But for sure, you know, as, a, as Italian, we, we all grow with the, with the myth of Marco Pantani. Yes. And as a, I'm from Trentino, so of course, in the same age, same years, there were Gilberto Simone, who was dominating the Giro too. Yes. So th these two riders, for sure, they were the two we were watching the most. Yes. And, and who was your mentor and, and teach you about cycling and about reading the races? I think you have a special feeling for the races when you see when to attack, maybe when to stay cool, when to move. Uh, uh, Develop this as a pro, or did you have somebody who, who taught you from the beginning to see and, and feel the race? I think it was never like this. I mean, it's something that you have or you don't have. Yeah. So uh, that's something that maybe make the difference into a race. I also make my mistake, of course, but I think it's all is all about uh, really analyzing what you do after every race. Uh, in terms of uh, having a guy who really pushed me to do that was uh, Flavio, one of the trainers I got when I was a uh, junior. And he yes. kept following me through the under-23 and professional too. So as I, as I say from an interview a few days ago, he, I think he, he say good job maybe three times okay. in all this year. So okay. he always keep my feet on the ground. He always find not the bad thing, but something who can be made better instead of watching what everything was good. So let's say if 90% of the race was good, he was watching the 10%, he wasn't watching the 90. So more and more he was pointing the, the little detail and, and he was always searching the perfection. So that, that's keep you on the ground and then that's keep you analyzing what you do and, and try to do better next time. There is always a way to, to get better. And you feel you still do this when you, when you have races yes, today and you, you look back and you analyze this and you're still in contact with, with Flavio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, are, we, we are not really, really in contact at the moment because uh, he's, I think, he's just doing a, a grandpa at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's doing, he's doing uh, cyclocross with the cyclocross team of the region, and, and mostly that. And then on the road race, uh, if he didn't, oh, this year it's impossible because we are uh, all, all the youth category, youth category are not racing. So even even if he got the team, uh, he's, he's not on the on the job for the moment. But we're still in contact, uh, and we hear not so much as is as it was in the past. But when we hear, it's always uh, it's always for a reason. Sometimes he just called me and they say, "Ah, that was good, but <laughs> <laughs> good, yeah. good. I like that." Yeah, and, and it's the same for me. So we, we spend maybe just just for say hello, and then we stand we stay for 25, 30 minutes on the phone talking about everything in the sport. Very good, nice. I think it's important to have people in life to, to take you back and, and to ground you as well and say, hey, this is what you've done. Because if everybody claps on your shoulder, uh, I think that's one thing. But I think if somebody kind of challenges you and say, hey, you could have done this better, I think that's, that's really yeah. where, we, where we gain and where we learn. Yeah, I think as a sport, people who, who want to be uh, on the top tier of the sport for, for a long time, you don't need people clapping on your shoulder. Yeah. Uh, because at the end, uh, the moment you think to be the best as you can be, then there is the moment when you start to go, you are on the, in your downhill. So if your career make like this, the moment you say, am I there, then you're down already. Someone else will come and, and be better than you. What do you think about your personality? If you think about your biggest strength, 
And what's your maybe a part where you feel like you have really room for improvement? Um, what, what would you say? Um, you mean in, in, in related to cycling? Yeah, yeah. If you feel uh, like you're training not enough, or you feel like you, you need somebody to motivate no, you. No, maybe, maybe some, or... uh, let's from a weak point. Sometimes maybe I need to to get really a little bit more hard into suffer. I'm a little bit of a pussy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like to die on my bike. But sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes I do it. Even I go over over the limit, uh, and you can really feel it. But uh, I reckon I I never really get into the limit, and I really I was really like 120 percent. Maybe some, maybe maybe a few times. But I, I, there are some riders maybe that they can really go super deep. Like you can see, maybe it's more common in other sport when you see how hard they go on a on a cross country skiing. Or mm -hmm. when they, they cross the finish line, also on the maybe 1,500 meters in the athletics, they, they really go so deep that the body, they cannot even walk after that. So it, it's never happened too many times to me to, to get over the finish line and can barely walk after, after, the, after the finish line. When uh, was the last time you went so deep? I uh, don't even remember. I don't even remember. Because maybe sometimes in, in cycling, you go, you go so deep uh, before. And then you waste your body before, and maybe you go to the to the sprint or you get to the finish, and, and your body is already recovered, but you cannot even make that effort because yes. your legs are so, so dead that you can't even go there. Yes. So uh, it's a matter of the fact of where you are. Maybe I was really deep in a sprint I did in um, in Tour of England last year. Yeah, I came from really far away in the back, and it was Edwin, so I could surf between the wheels, but it was like 350 meter sprint, and I crossed the finish line. I was third, and And it was incredible how hard was my leg for 20 minutes after. And it was incredible because I was so concentrated to serve between the wheels and I was pushing 1,250, 1,300 watts for almost 20 seconds. Wow. So it's, uh, it was a super effort that was like because of the concentration, I couldn't feel. Of course, the condition was good. Otherwise, you can not do that. But I wasn't really, I was so concentrated to, to push and push and push and push that at the moment, I get over the finish line. I, I was like, oh, that was painful. Cool, very good. Um, I have a question from Charles, and he he said he notices sometimes that people have the number 13 and they put the number 13 upside down. Um, what what's the reason behind this? And are you are you superstitious with anything when it comes to racing? Uh, so first part of the question, I think it's coming from kind of uh, Italian superstition because Italians are the most superstition population in the whole world. Uh, it's just a sign of 13 is like a kind of uh, unlucky number. So you yes. have 13 and 17 in, in Italy as an as a unlucky number. So sometimes they, they just put it upside down in term of uh, it will bring me good luck and not bad luck, something like this. I. Honestly, never did that. I don't even know if I ever raced with the 13. That's for sure I never did if I raced with the 13. And I'm not superstition, superstitious. Okay. So, so nothing I, you have a ritual before the race where you say always I'm doing the same things and I'm, I'm no. keeping this or no? You just go no, in. No, no. I just go in the race. There are yeah. riders who always do the same thing or ah, today I came off the bed from, from the wrong side, uh, this kind of honor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Is it, is it when you go into race mode and you put the helmet on is are you you feel you're changing is there a different Matteo on the bicycle than uh, Matteo when you come home to your boys and and you come at home or what is changing when you get into into race mode how, how do you get into race mode uh normally I try to stay as as most relaxed as possible yeah before my the race uh let, let, let's put it this way I divide the race in different sectors there is a place where I know that I can talk with friends uh, and just chilling in the peloton and doing nothing and maybe go to grab some bottle, talk with the sport director, talk with the other sport director that I know in the other cars, you know, uh, everyone. Uh, the, the peloton is a kind of a super big family. I only changed three teams uh, and now with the three teams I changed, probably the guys with the I was in, in three teams, they spread into 20. So I knew someone in 20, 25 different teams already. Yes. And And of course, uh, there is a time where I can do this. And I always say, uh, and it's also part of a study, a psychological study, you cannot keep your focus, the, the top focus, you cannot keep it for more than 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. There is no way you can stay super focused for more than 20, 40, 45 minutes if you're really good. So I always think 
I need to be focused in a certain period of the race. Yeah. Uh, so in the classics, it's easier. You know that this this part of the race, you need to be focused, you need to be in the front, uh, and then maybe you can relax for the next 20K. So that's what I do. I split the race in part, and I know where I need to be focused and where I can really relax and, uh, and take it a little bit more easy. And I know that on the final, I need to be focused and I need to be 100% on the bike, uh, and I need to be on my on my own board, uh, and of course, with the, with the ear on the on the radio to know what's happening yeah. by the directors. But it, it's a kind of uh, putting myself into into that position uh, where I need to be, because if you stay the whole race super concentrated, then at the end there is a moment where you get out of your bubble, and maybe it's the moment that you you, you don't have to. When you need it, you need to be there. Very good. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Is it, is it, you get a lot of information from the car? Is it 50-50 that you get information from the car or are you making your own decisions and sometimes you call a shot uh, even so they, uh, they don't create the situation? It's depending upon the race. Mm -hmm. Because like in the classics, for example, last year, uh, most of the classics, we, we, the car, the closest car was 15 minutes behind. Okay. So they don't know, they also don't know what's happening. They know what's happening from television but if the television has a bad cover or something, then then you then you make your own call. You need to be good enough to to understand the situation, who's in front, who's is not, uh, who can be your uh, a rival, or who's yeah. racing against you, and who can be your helper for the moment if you have no teammates, or, or which team can have the same tactics as you have. So you know you need to go to talk to the right people in the right moment. Yes, it's. Uh, I always say, if you if you put it simple. A bike race is like you take a soccer field and you put 20 teams and 20 teams playing against each other. Yes. So uh, you need to understand every single team has a single tactic and you need to surf into that, understand what they want to do, with who, the, for who they are racing and what's the goal. Well, it's, it's quite com more complicated than now it's look on television. I, I remember and I, I encourage everyone to watch this uh, with uh, Brahma. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think he is. I think it really sums up what the, the sport director and what the team behind the cyclist is going through during a race. And and he was he was really uh, screaming into the into the radio to to speak to you to say, hey, you can do it, you can do it. And it was just an amazing uh, an amazing uh, situation. So is he is he speaking to? Is he motivating you? Is this something that really pushes you to the, to put that extra level, or is it uh, how do you how do you see that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's really needed. Uh, to, to come back to your question before, that day the, the car was really important because it was the first car behind the breakaway. Yes. And I was, I was looking by myself, two or three guys I knew they could make a shot to go, to go solo to the finish line and he was looking all the rest. So he was telling me who were attacking. And I still remember Burgard made an attack from, uh, I don't know, let's say two and a half k to go just to make a number. And he told me the radio, watch out, it's coming from the back. So I knew someone was coming from the back and I was ready to jump in the wheel or to jump in the wheel on whoever was chasing him down. Okay. And, and this has happened a few times in, in, that, in that specific day. But a lot of time it can work if the sport director behind is smart enough to, to guide you and to help you in a certain kind of way. And yes. on the other hand, of course, when you're really suffering, if you have someone who push you, it's, uh, it's an extra. Of course, maybe you give that one or two percent more to to get over the the effort and, and maybe and maybe win the race or maybe stay with the group or whatever it's gonna be. You were here in Dubai as well, 2016, uh, when when Marcel Kittel won the tour, and then I, I found one picture when we were together for for dinner uh, after the race with Quick Step, uh, with Marcel and Tony, yep. and you were there and we went for dinner. So what what do you remember from the race of Dubai? Uh, I remember the, the first year was, uh, I was there the two years uh, Marcel won, uh, but the first year was kind of special because he was coming into Quick Step as a new guy and uh, we, we had to come to Dubai mostly for uh, building up the, the, the Lido train for him. And at the yes. end we came home with, uh, I think, three victories and, uh, and the GC. So yes. it, was, it was really good uh, also for, for a rider like him coming back from a really bad year into into a super winning uh, winning year in quick step and and for us starting the season like that because of what, for most of the guys was the first race of the season and it was really successful you had an amazing start of your career you know when you immediately went to quick step as a as a team 
which I would consider at that time one of the best, still maybe one of the best uh, teams in the world. And you were the first team as a professional. I think you were there as well under in, in the junior ranks. But this is amazing that you already make it to quick step in your first in your first year. Uh, yeah, it was it was kind of uh, not, not strange, but it was super quick to be honest because. Um, I was I was a good rider as a junior, and then uh, uh, in Italy we had like the uh, fifth grade or the end of the high school, let's say, yes. when you are first year under twenty three. So I was more focused into into the school, and then I started my university, uh, and then I was more focused into university school and lifestyle. So then it came into my mind like, okay, if I need to, if, if I want to be professional, I need to try to to get every 100% to, to cycling. And then let's see uh, how it, it, this will develop if I can if I can be a pro rider or not. And, and Rezo started to come almost straight away. Uh, so from my third year under 23, I start to win, let's say from half of the season. Uh, and the year after it, I won six races in three months. And then I signed my contract with Quickstep. And I passed professional already in June, in August, sorry. I signed in June and I passed professional in August. So it was really quick. Yeah, very good. And if you would have not turned out to be a professional cyclist, uh, what, what would you have studied or that, what would have been the other career if not cyclist? I don't know, because my plan A was working, so <laughs> I didn't have to go on the plan B. I finished the university anyway uh, yeah. in 2015, but I never really had to use my, my degree for, uh, for a job. So I, I don't know. Uh, I started with the plan A that was try to be a cyclist. I plan A succeed, so I didn't have to go back on the plan B. Very good. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I want to take you back a little bit in a few years. And when you started 2013 and you had your first Tour de France and immediately stage 14, uh, you, you had the first victory in the Tour de France stage, which is for, for some people, obviously, it takes years and years to build up. And I think you, what I liked about that stage was that it was a, a bunch with a lot of really, really high profile riders and you stayed cool and you just went a little bit further back and you, you just won the sprint. Do you remember that date uh, in, in 2013? Yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember I was really angry from the day before because the, the, the day before Cavendish won in a crosswind uh, yeah. and we split the bunch to drop, uh, to drop Marcel, actually, that was the plan. And, and we succeeded to drop him. But then on the last echelon when Contador attacked with his team, uh, I was in the back of the bunch eating eating a bar uh, and then i just and i just missing the the last echelon and i was the guy who has to be with cavendish and he made it and he won the race but i was really angry because i say fuck it's my it's my opportunity to be there to help to to show myself in a small group and blah 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 and i wasn't there and the day after i made it into the breakaway and and yeah uh i'll I was good in the sprint, but I was also uh, lucky to have Bramo with me that really kept me calm. And as, as soon as we passed the second last climb, he just told me, okay, John, you now sit in the wheel, you are an pro. Nobody here is an professional. You're still the youngest of this, of this rider. It's, it's your job to bring you to the finish. And then if they bring you there, maybe you can do something. And then, as I told you before, I, I, I pick my guys, he pick his guys. Uh, and at the, end, at the end, it's working. It was working super good. So it, it was really nice. Also because it was my first Tour de France and, and it was a race I maybe shouldn't even do because I did the Giro already that year and there were a really long discussion with the, in the team with me and Rolf Alda was there at that time and about going in the Tour for Cavendish for the leadout train and this and that. Uh, maybe if you explode, you can go home. It's not a problem. We, we keep you there for two weeks and then the third week is option. Yes. And at the end, I won... I won the, the race, was a, I think it was a Saturday before the mountain stage. So it was basically the end of the second week. Yeah, stage 14, uh, yes. Yeah, it was the end of the second week. So it was quite into the Tour de France. Yes. It wasn't at the beginning. Uh, yeah, as a, as a young neo professional, winning a, winning a stage in the Tour was, was quite amazing. But how deep are you going in, in your recovery? Or how, how long does it take to recover uh, from from a three week stage race because obviously most of us are riding once a what a, three times a week four times a week and we're riding a couple of hours but you're riding for 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 twenty days and it, it's it, how long does it really take you to to be halfway normal again? Uh, 
I never, I never get to that point because as not being a, a GC rider, we we always drop on the on the climbs. So mm-hmm. most of the most of the time, we never go in the red zone on the climbs. It's happened maybe when the climbs on the start. Of course, you need to stay in the bunch, so you really go deep. But most of the time, we take the last climb as a as a as a just riding to the finish. Or if you drop two climb to the finish, you have your calculation to get into the time cut, and maybe because you have twenty one stages, you know already. Eight stages are not for you because are too too hard, and then you you pinpoint your races. So you just put a red circle around. I want to I want to be good in this stage and this stage and in this stage. Mm-hmm. So you use the Tour de France to build up your condition more more than in the start, of course. And, and my goal, especially in the last year, was getting into a Grand Tour and coming off the Grand Tour with a better shape. Yes. So at the end, is not how dead I am, but how tired I am. So mm-hmm. it's only it's only a matter of recovering. And I know that after one week, 10 days, two weeks, depending from the type of the Grand Tour, I'm I'm in a better condition than I was in the start. So that, that's where I can really go into, into some bigger goals. We met you 2019 after we were at the last stage in, in Paris and we saw the final. And it was obviously super amazing to see the team. Everyone was so happy uh, having a and glass it was of wine. Uh, yes. <laughs> And, and then we went for, for lunch the other day. And I, I think you were really relaxed, actually. And I, I thought you're going to be tired uh, and you're not going to be able to do anything. But you look, you look very lean and you looked in a, in a perfect shape. And, but you were, you were all there. You were not, I, I didn't see you really being tired. So I, I was actually quite impressed. I think you were looking forward to see the boys because you haven't seen them for three weeks. But uh, quite impressed about this. And you, now it makes sense when you see you're not getting out of the, the tour completely shattered. Um, and then you had a good a good finish of 2019 as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it's like that because also because okay, it's our job. So we we train every day, we train hard, we train altitude, and to all, always to to be the best as we can be into this race. And uh, and at the end, uh, we are more like especially in the tour. Most of the time, the tour I did, it was more hard in, mentally than physically. Mm-hmm. Because of the, it's a, the biggest race in the world, so people are expecting more, uh, teams are expecting more. There is that little extra stress uh, and long transfers, uh, a lot of time in the bus, a lot of meetings. And also, if, if, you, if you win or if you do results, you have a lot of interviews. Uh, there is a lot of things to do and, and has to be done during the Tour de France that you cannot see as a, as a normal spectator or, a, or yes. in front of the television. And that's if you're not able to uh, divide yourself in in two different steps, so when you are in your room, you are in your room and you relax. If you start to do something else, then it adds a little bit of stress or the stress you already had. So it's really important to to relax when you have the time. Who is with you in the room? Uh, now it's changed, obviously, you're with CCC now, but with whom you're normally staying in the room? Uh, I, always, I always change my roommate, actually. Okay. Uh, uh, but if you speak about the Grand Tour, uh, I was rooming with uh, Jack Hague last year in the tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I only did the tour last year. So, But I always changed my roommate. I never got uh, a fixed roommate. Okay, when I was a professional, I always room with uh, Stegmans. And, and who, what, what do you do to relax? You listen to music, uh, you, you play uh, games? I just, or... I just watch, just watch movies, uh, reading books, so call the family. Uh, spending quite a lot of time calling the family, and for the rest, nothing special. Just just relaxing the mind, uh, and being being away from the stress. That's all. Just sitting on the bed and doing nothing. Is music something you you use to relax? What's on your playlist? Uh, I normally I don't have many many super relaxing music. I'm I'm more like a rock and roll, uh, punk What's rock. The... Uh, so metal, if, we, if, we, if your phone was on your playlist now, what's your uh, favorite? Wait, do I have your telephone? Now, now I tell you, I have no idea. Okay. Oh, my phone is here. Wait. So, uh, Spotify says. So I was I was listening just before. Yes. Uh, Eric Eric Clapton was on just okay. before. I was on the rollers with Santana, Pink Floyd, Guns N' Roses. That that's what Spotify picked up for me. So, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Bon Jovi, The Kings. 
Three bits of press something. This one I don't know. <laughs> this kind of music, more more rock music and this kind of uh, music that transmits you energy. Yes. And sometimes I don't know why I get in the in the mood of jazz and classical. Very good. Uh, in 2014, I think was as well a great stage because you came back. Obviously, you were you were going with with the team again 2014 for Tour de France, and then it was a super hard finish. Uh, it was stage seven, and you beat Peter Sagan by just I think uh, one or two millimeters on the line, and it was just amazing. Again, I encourage everyone to watch it in YouTube to see how the people in the car reacted, and it wasn't clear if you won or not, if you pay second or or, or first. And uh, the, uh, Davide was uh, very excited when he heard he won, and it's really, really exciting to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It. it was super hard. Yeah, it was a really hard finish, and it was a the I think it was the longest stage of the Tour de France that year. Uh, yeah, I also didn't know I uh, I won. I was sure that Peter beat me on the line because yes. I think I did three other meters of sprint or something like this. Yes. Uh, but at the end, I just won for uh, maybe it was one centimeter. More okay. or less, because it was, was like was like a length of the tire, but it was coming faster from the back. So it was really it was really suspicious because he was sure that he wasn't sure to to be the winner, and I was quite sure he won. And at the end, it turned out that the photo finish say I won. So yes. okay, better for me. Yes, very good. You meet him sometimes. You meet Peter and other people when you go out for training. Is this something? Uh, uh... Not not really a lot of times. Uh, I, I train a lot with uh, with Philippe Schubert. Okay. Uh, with Brambilla when he's here. And uh, Viviani a few times. Yeah. Uh, but also, it, it's always difficult when it's racing time. When it's racing time, everyone is everywhere. And, and maybe you just do go out, maybe for the Monday ride or the Tuesday ride, uh, coffee ride. Yes. During the season, we train more together on the coffee ride. Okay. Very good. So you go together and then you really stop somewhere on the way or you come back to, to the place and then you, you meet somewhere and have no, a no, Most of the time we just meet all together on the or one specific place. So we say, okay, where we want to go, we're going to go to... Normally we always say we go to Italy or we go to France. So okay. when is the coffee day, we go to Italy. Sorry to all the Frenchies here on the online, but oh, yeah. Italian coffee is better. <laughs> Italian coffee is better. Very good. Okay, I agree. Um, in 2019, you had a stage and it was as well, stage 17. And you attacked about 15 kilometers to go. And it's, I was wondering, obviously, it was a super strong group as well. And, and you, it, it, you made it look really easy. You just rode away from that group. And, and they were kind of looking at each other. And, and you, uh, it was 15 kilometers to the finish. Is this something you picked that stage? You, you trained for that stage? You looked exactly where to attack? Uh, but how did you read that situation on that day? Uh, actually, uh, on your first question, yes, I picked that stage. And actually, in the whole tour, I picked two stages. One was the one in Banier de Bigorre, where I was catched by the by the climbers 3K from the top of the last climb. If I couldn't go a little bit further, I probably could win also that stage. And the other one was this one. And I was already looking into that stage already from the from the first rest day, because I knew it was it was a stage for the breakaway. Because of course, into a Grand Tour, you have these stages that you know the breakaway gonna go there. Yes. And the group was really big. And then, yeah, I made it into the last selection. And as you say, I, I ride away, but because they were watching each other, but it was super hard because I, yes. I, I probably got a really good day because I got some calls afterwards and they told me, oh, but you didn't see the images. No, I don't see that. Why? And I said, oh, because there were one moment when Asgreen attacked, you close yeah. the gap, it looks like you don't even breathe. And I, actually, I was watching the images later and said, okay, that looks like I'm easy here. <laughs> yeah. No, it was Abermann, Askren, Mollema, Toynes, Ors. There were lots of super strong people, and you just, uh, it, at least in TV, obviously, I'm, I'm sure that was a big effort, but it was just like you were just going. Yeah, yeah. I, reckon, yeah. I reckon the moment I went away was, was really a moment where everyone was uh, on the limit. I was yes. probably also on the limit, but I, I got that little percentage more than the other. Uh, and when I went and I just saw me go and when everyone is, is really blocked, then, then you get to a point that, okay, someone is going to close this gap. I don't want to close it. Uh, and I was the guy who, who really benefited of this, of this situation. It's always mm -hmm. happening in a race. And yes. it's normally, it's a, normally there is a stronger strider who go and the others who, who play between each other. And probably it's, it's, it was like this. And then at the end, I, I, I always gain time on the climb. So I, I reckon uh, I made a pretty good effort going to the finish. Fantastic, fantastic. 
So you won three stages in the tour. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. Um, and then obviously important because cycling is, is really like a religion in Italy. So the first time you won in, I think it in 2016, you won a stage of the Giro. Yep. Yes. And I think as well, there was a quite a remarkable stage when uh, there was Brabilla and Mosa. Uh, there was a, there was quite a steep climb at the end. And I think they were, they were looking to, to make a sprint amongst two riders. Uh, and you were kind of a surprised third person coming into the game, coming from the back. And it was quite a distance, but you catched up fairly quickly. And I think Brambilla saw you and you mentioned he's a good friend. And suddenly uh, you surprised Moser and, and you, you just had an amazing sprint finish and you had time to celebrate uh, this, this sprint victory and uh, gave you the first Giro Italia uh, stage win. Yeah, that was I think about like uh, television wall is, is the best victory I ever had. Like I'm not even in the image until 250 meters to go on the second last corner. So that, that was pretty nice. And also uh, I was at that time it was 2016. So I was training, I was training quite a lot with Moser too, because he's from my region and he was also living in Monaco at the time. So uh, it, it was, it was like a kind of, a, not a group of friends, but almost. So yes. uh, uh, we, we were also talking about that and being on the same region, we were also taking, I think, a little bit of a piece of the, of the situation. But do you think, is it something of a characteristic that you don't give up ever? Because I think most people would have said, listen, they're gone. They, and and there, there was almost no chance you're going to make it back. Yeah, I think they were clear. And then suddenly you were there. And I, I saw you really in the, in the picture, you see you really fighting to, to get back to them. And, and suddenly you win that stage. And it's obviously amazing. Yes, of course. And uh, even that even that year, uh, it was my last chance to win a stage, and mm -hmm. I also put, put, uh, put that stage on the with the uh, you know with the, with the red circle on the calendar. Uh, I made it to the breakaway. I made it to the third cut, first cut into the into the first climb of the day, uh, and then I knew that few other people was stronger than me on the climb. But one of them was Brambi. Uh, he already won a stage uh, in uh, in Arezzo uh, with my help into the breakaway, so we knew he could follow the the move and use my. And use me as an excuse to, to pull less uh, going to the finish. Uh, and I also was, I was not pulling also in the back because it was in the front. So I just waiting the this steep climb you mentioned before. It was like a kind of seven or 800 meters really steep on the cobbles. And I attack hoping that they're going to look each other for the sprint and, and get back. And at the end, it was working. Yes. So at the end, in cycling, you never know what's happening, especially when it's, uh, the group in the front is small, then you have, uh, then you have a good possibility to, to get back because they start to play cat and mouse and, and you, if you really push behind and you have good legs, then you can close the gap. I think you were trying something similar when it was um, Milan Sanremo, uh, when you when you went over the podio and then you coming down to the last finish. And then it was like, in, I think it was 2019, it was two kilometers to go. And I think you you went for, for the finish and maybe you were hoping for a similar situation that they- uh, Yeah, yeah, it didn't work. A little bit. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> yes, okay, but yeah, yeah, yeah they, they moved. They move. It, it, it's always like a situation there. Uh, Sagan went straight away when I, when I attack. So he already keeps the, the pressure up on the group behind and then both one out attack again. Mm -hmm. And at that point it was already gone. It, it's a kind of a gamble, no? You, yes. you try your move, I try my move. Sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not. So yes. it was a try to be, to be sure to have a win. And then Paris Tours has been a really good race for you. You won it twice as well. And I think yeah. quite, quite uh, to mention is as well, you won with uh, an average speed of 49.64 kilometers per hour at 234 kilometers distance. I think that's yes. just remarkable. <laughs> I think it's the that's... fastest classic uh, race ever. Uh, yeah, it's the fastest classic ever done. Yeah, it was like a special special weather condition. Of course, to, to, to make a speed like that, you need a special yes. weather condition and a special race too. Uh, we started in... Uh, in the in the neighborhood of Paris, and it was like a cross take crosswind all the way to to tours. So we split the group straight away after five k. It was a group of 30, 35 riders, and we all we all racing. We just racing. We just pull all the way to the finish, all together. Everyone took his pull. Everyone took his his, uh, his time in front of the bunch, uh, making the speed, and, yes. and that's why we got that speed. Uh, and then the wind turned as a headwind going into the finish. Otherwise, it. Uh, I think 30 kilometers to go, we were still 51 kilometers an hour average. Wow. So it was really, really quick. 
I think I never even I never I never even used the the last five years of my cassette. Yes, <laughs> five years up. Yes, fantastic, fantastic. And um, you raced obviously as well European Championship in 2018. You became European champion. You, you raced World Championships. Um, how is it when you put on the Italian team kit? Uh, is this is this something very very special? Becoming Italian. Um, is this changing your mentality when you go for racing, when you put on the team kit for your nation? Yeah, it's, uh, it's different because, you're, uh, first of all, you, you represent your nation. So you, you're not going uh, on a race representing your sponsor or your, your trading team, but you represent the whole nation. So every single Italian who's, who's proud to be Italian in, uh, in Italy or all over the world. And especially when you go around uh, on the World Championship, you always find people who's Italian, who, whose parents were Italian, but they feel a little bit Italian, uh, that, that, that come in the start or in the, or in the hotel or wherever you are and, and say, ah, you know, I'm Italian, I'm living here from uh, this time. And I'm really, really glad you come here. Good luck and blah, blah, blah. And it's always nice to be everywhere in the world, even in Qatar, they were coming. So, yes. so you have like uh, Italians everywhere. Everywhere you go in the world, you can find uh, an Italian that is, uh, that is there for working or for living or, or their parents were Italian and he, and he maybe never see Italy before, but he feel a little bit Italian uh, into, his, into his heart. I think this is very nice about Italians that obviously, first of all, the language obviously is, is just, it sounds so great when you speak. And I think you have that passion for your nation, uh, which I think is fantastic. And as you said, we, we, we see this a lot when, um, when we see people racing and we, we follow you and racing and people are really, really proud to be, to be Italian. Um, I want to as well take you to Harrogate, um, to, to the World Championship uh, 2019. And I was in Harrogate on, on Friday and Swift. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and, I, yeah, and it was, was really tough to do the, to do the lap there. <laughs> and I, um, well, were, I, you, were you in the swimming pool? If you were in the swimming pool with a fan over you, then it's more or less the same temperature. Yes. <laughs> this, was, this was an unbelievable day. And I can't even imagine how it can be that you ride for, for six hours. And I think six hours, 40 minutes. Uh, 210 kilometers. It was 90. 270. How much? 270. 270. So, yeah. so an unbelievable distance. It was nine degrees. It was raining, I think, straight away from the beginning. It was raining yeah, yeah, from, all day long. From the start of the race. How do you keep yourself going to, to stay kind of motivated in a race for, for, for such a long time in such miserable conditions? Yeah, uh, that, that's also part of uh, uh, know what you have to do in this kind of races, because uh, the, the biggest error you can do with this kind of races is not eating or not drinking. Okay. Because you, uh, about drinking, of course, it's raining, so I, you just open your mouth and it's like you're drinking, but it's not the same thing. And, and eating, most of the time, you're frozen, and so you just don't want to make movement that you don't you don't like too much. Uh, our body is not made to make like this in the pocket of a cycling jersey. <laughs> So most of the time when it's super cold, you struggle even to do that. You yes. struggle to open the, the bars or the gel or whatever it is. So if sometimes, okay, I just, just skip this lap, I take the next lap. And then you do one time, you do two times, you do three times, and then certainly you find, you find yourself without any energy. Yes. Uh, and that's the first mistake you can do in this kind of race. Second mistake is uh, don't change your clothing. Mm -hmm. I already prepared before the start, uh, all the whole clothing change into my into my rain bag and I change actually everything just before coming into Aerogate. I changed my rain jacket, I changed my GABA, I changed my, no, I didn't change my jersey, of course, because it was a skin suit, so I couldn't change the jersey, but I changed all the clothing who were pretending to be the, the shell, let's put it this way. Yes. And you that helped quite a lot. You support that with Castelli and, and you mentioned the GABA, I think it's just turned 10 years. And I think this is a, a special piece of equipment uh, from Castelli, and I think everyone was really happy when this was introduced about 10 years ago into the Peloton. Uh, that was a special piece. Have you, have you used it for, for many years? Uh, yeah, it, it came into the Peloton. Everyone was kind of laughing at the beginning. It was like, what, what is that? It's not a, it's not a uh, I would call it, it's not a rain jacket. It's not something that, what's that? And then we, we just realized they got a good idea. So uh, they, they invented and then of course when, when someone has a good idea everyone is copying it and, and now it's a, it's a standard for every, every single pro rider no, nobody, nobody missed this in this rainbow 
Yes, I, I see at the beginning, they, they put a marker and they put about the Castelli logo, they put the marker over it that they, uh, that they could use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the beginning, there were a lot of riders buying that uh, from them and, and putting away the putting away the sponsors and, uh, and put their own sponsor or whatever they were doing. That was the same with the Astros rain jacket. Yes. Yes, in Harrogate you you became second, and but I I I've really looked the race again, and I'm, I'm not sure if you look. You did what you do normally. You attack from the front, and you were just going for it. And I think many sprints. If I looked at your sprints, a lot of the sprints you took from the front. You're not a sprinter who is hiding behind someone else. I think you you won many of your sprints from the first position, which I thought was quite remarkable because a lot of other sprinters wait for somebody else to go go in the slipstream. And then win the sprint, but you won many of these uh, in in the first position, and just by going as hard as you could. And this time it, it didn't really work. And how long how long do you realize that you became world champion? That you had the silver medal, and that you really appreciate the, the victory of this as well? Uh, I let's say I, I realized quite quite straight away that I, I wasn't winning the race <laughs> because Peterson passed me straight away after a launch my sprint. It was it took him. A few seconds to to pass me, so it was just stronger in that situation. Uh, of course, it still uh, still hurt quite a lot. It's it's quite annoying still, because when when you're there in, in that kind of situation, you know you can win, then then you have to win. Yes. But uh, but now it's part of the story. It's like this. Uh, get over it, and and of course uh, I'm already looking at the possibility to make uh, to be there one more time into the world championship, and this time maybe maybe put the rainbow jersey on. Very nice. Very good. You had a good start of the season 2020 already with Omlop. I think you had a really good performance as well there. Um, it was on the moor. It was, was, was hard. I think that was just a climb, which is a little steep um, overall. And then, but you had a good performance. You really, you really kept, kept a good power and everything. So how, how was that race for you? Uh, that was the first race I was planning to be good. Uh, and I was good at the end. Uh, of course, I dropped on the moor of Gerasbergen. Yeah. And it was a little bit because of the other guys, of course, because they were yeah. a little bit faster from the from the bottom. But I, I paced myself to be there uh, maybe on a five or six second gap. And then I got like a bad switch of my gears uh, on the last part. But I always say when you when you make a mistake on this kind of situation, it means that you are a little bit too much on the red zone. So mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't the gears who went by themselves. It was me who who made a mistake. And I got that extra little five or six seconds that I couldn't ever never close. Because I came really close before the Bosberg, then I did the Bosberg. I took a little bit of a gap again, and I was really, really close all the way to the finish. And they were in three, and I was alone. So yeah, it was a little bit of a pity, but it wasn't to my plan to to start to be good from the onlop, to then to rise again my shape during Paris uh, and then getting into the classics. Of course, we will never know if it was a good path or not because yes. races is over now and we are just waiting to exit the quarantine so uh, the lockdown quarantine is done so yeah. the the lockdown and, and training on the road again and, and restart the season what do you think is so far the biggest achievement if you look back in your career is there any day which really sticks out where you said listen that was the perfect day on the bike uh, is it is it the win you mentioned before Giro Italia 2016 or is it is it any other day you felt like this is the, uh, the perfect day for me? Pro probably the day I was stronger in terms of performance. I would say uh, the stage in the Vuelta in Andorra. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a group of 25 riders, top of uh, Colo di Ordino, and it's a uh, it's a good 10 kilometer climb, and I was still there. So a guy like me, I was probably the only guy not over 70, over 60 kilos. There was nobody over 60 kilos in that group. Uh, and I was still there. Of course, also the, the stage last year in the Flooring by Nier de Bigor was really, was quite outstanding in terms of performances. Uh, perfect day on bike, probably the European champion, because I won, of course. Otherwise, yes. there, there, there should be something different into perfection. Or, or even the stage I won in the Tour uh, 19. Uh, yes. uh, last year also that was like a, a pretty much a, a good day uh, there are a few situations like the first party tour I won I say to our press officer I call him on a, on a Thursday where we were talking about something else and I say to him listen do you have 10 euros I said why just just put it on party tour on Saturday I'm going to win and then I won so <laughs> and then he called me straight away after the race I asked you that I didn't put the 10 euros <laughs> um, 
if you had one race or what's your favorite race of the season and which race is on your wish list to win uh if you if you could pick one race and you say i can win this tomorrow which which is the one uh tomorrow maybe san remo san remo or, or flanders too well san remo or flanders can i pick two okay yes you're good I if i can two. pick two uh, san remo or flanders. flanders uh and a race that i really like uh but i really like a lot of races actually uh, uh one that i want to really get back in uh, to try to to win in really with a big focus is uh Amster. I only did it. Yeah, I only did it two times, and for two times I was good. So I reckon it can be a good race for me. But I never get to Amstel uh, with a, with a good program. Let's say to do Amstel. Of course, I always did Roubaix before, and that keeps you a little bit away from the results. If you if you do if you do Roubaix and then Amstel, of course, because Roubaix is a really really demanding race. Your wife was a professional athlete as well. Uh, she yep. was in downhill skiing and slalom and super G. Uh, and and who is faster on the ski now? You she will she will kick your butt on the ski slope or you your competitiveness kicks in? Anywhere. No, no, yeah. no. There is no competition. No competition. <laughs> no competition. No, 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 no. I saw her ski the first time. You can see you can see she was she was doing that as a on a quite a really high level. It's a, yes. it's a different, it's a really different way to ski. And she can understand, let's say, the sacrifices you go through because she was a professional athlete. She can, she can help you to, uh, with, with the stress you're going through and you, 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 you can relay better or she can relay better to what you're going through when you're training for the season because she was an athlete for herself before. Yeah, yeah, especially especially when you have like a, a, a bad situation or maybe you have some problems and, you know, uh, it's not always flowers in a, in an athlete's life. There, there is some moments that you have maybe maybe problems. Maybe you train and the result doesn't come. So, uh, of course, she's really helpful, especially in the in the best situation when everything mm. is okay. Uh, I reckon it's not difficult for everyone. But uh, you see, how good is next to you when the situation are, are quite difficult. If you come home to Italy and and maybe after a race and you reward yourself, maybe you go home and see your family. And and when you come home to your mom, what do your mom is cooking for you when you come home? Uh, uh, actually, it was Claudia cooking for me. <laughs> uh, it's depending from the mood. For example, after a three weeks tour, I, I hate to eat basically anything. I just eat salad for a week because you always get into carb loading every day. You're just eating like you are a tractor and you put like food inside like this. And yes. you finish the three weeks that you're basically dying for food. But when we come back to Italy, that we can shop on a proper Italian supermarket. We, we love the food of our region. So uh, polenta, uh, rabbit, uh, or uh, a, a good like a roast chicken, um, pasta, pasta with pesto, pasta, pasta with uh, ragu, uh, bolognese sauce is ragu. Um, what else? Lasagne. Very nice. Yeah, we have a lot of things. You have a special meal, maybe you prepare for before Paris tours or anything you you were eating. Is there? Is it is it really pasta you eat before to do some carbo loading? Uh, uh yes and no. Uh, when I'm home, when I start my carbo loading home, uh, I have a friend who has a, a farm with a biological product. Okay. Uh, or, organic, sorry. Yes. And uh, I don't know what the name in English. I think it's spelled the, the right name in English. Uh, spelled, arro. Spelled? Wait, I need Google Translate. <laughs> Good. Uh, one second. I like a porridge kind of time? No, it's like a cereal. Okay. So in English, maybe that's I tell you in German. Muesli? No, 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 no. That, that's for, for the breakfast. Dinkel. Ah, Dinkel. Okay. You know the, the, the name in English? Yes, yes, yes. I don't know in English, but we will... That's now we keep the secret between two of us, you know. What I mean, the, okay, is, okay, perfect. Nobody yeah. else will know it. Nobody else. So, so th this friend of mine always send us a few few packages of his own dinkel. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, and Claudia found a really nice recipe with a uh, fresh tomato, basil, avocado, feta cheese, and a little bit of olive oil. And okay. it's really nice because it's uh, you can you can eat like 300 grams of that and you're yes. you still fine. It's pretty light on the stomach and he has a lot of carbo. 
inside. It doesn't have a lot of uh, gluten, so that's why probably it's not so it's not so heavy on the stomach. On the stomach, and, yes. I, and I like to have a lot of that uh, for the carbo loading. Okay, very good, very good. I keep this as a secret for Friday morning, so that's oh, a yeah. oh, yeah. tip that I can I can perform a little better. First time, first time you're gonna go out, you're gonna ride solo in the front. Very good, <laughs> like that. Um, if you come home again to Italy, is it something where people recognize you and, and they, they named already a street after you or a plaza? Is there anything in plan uh, for Matteo Trentin? No. Uh, via Matteo Trentin? No, nothing, 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 nothing. Okay. No, go. you know, we, we come, I come from a small town and we're living in a small town. So people, people know me. Um, there's not many people who uh, just, uh, what you say, surprised to see me on the, on the square or on a supermarket or whatever. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but Italians are crazy about obviously when you're the national team and you're Tour de France champion, you're a cyclist. So that's that's uh, I've been a couple of times in Italy for the Giro Italia for with Castelli and so on. And it's just an unbelievable atmosphere. I think this is this is crazy how, how they yeah, uh, I think we're about like we and Spanish are the most warm, uh, uh, I would say, tifosi that you can yes. find uh, on the road. I have two more questions uh, for you before we head to our uh, burning questions. How is it being part of CCC and how is this different to other teams you have written in the past? It's coming from Wesley. Uh, yeah, um, I can speak more between uh, Mincheton and, uh, and Quick Step because unluckily I didn't race too much with CCC until now. Yes, no. uh, let's say, let's put it this way. Every pro tour team or every top tier team has the same base. So you have everything. Nothing is missing. Yes. Uh, race program is that one, more or less. We don't change too much your race program, or at least I didn't. Yes. Um, it's changing a little bit. Like uh, Quick Step was more like uh, winning, 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 winning. So super, super focus, super, uh, super uh, focus on the winning. Uh, Michetto was more like a kind of uh, friend, friends bunch. Okay. So uh, winning, of course, is always there. You race for winning. You don't race for for going out and having a barbecue. But it's uh, it was more relaxed as an atmosphere. And uh, let's say uh, CCC is a little bit in the middle, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, less like, less like uh, Australian style compared to compared to Mitchelton, but it's not the same uh, super uh, winning uh, extra focus like it was Quick Step. I think it comes across quite nicely with the backstage pass they have from Scott Mitchelton. I think that's nice. I think it and really when we met you at uh, the 2019 uh, last stage of the tour, it really was a good atmosphere um, amongst them. Obviously, you were finished with the tour and everything, but it really felt like uh, like a nice community in, in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, I have one more question from Ernesto, and it said, how do you keep motivated and how do you get to go on your bike every day? Is it something that you have to force yourself sometimes or you just enjoy cycling so much? Uh, you just want to go? Dep depending from the situation. Like, I... I reckon if the if the question is related to the moment as as now, so how I can keep myself motivated to train without any objective at the moment. Yes, it's it's difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. It's difficult because uh, as a sport sport athlete, as an athlete, you, you need a goal. You cannot train because just because you you need to train. Um, yes. Of course, the, the the first goal at the moment is training outside. Yes. So I'm still, I'm still waiting in the moment the government will say to us, okay, guys, you can go out and train outside. Yes. So I try to keep myself as fit as possible yes. without, without burning too much. Uh, yes. I do, today, for example, I did a double rel roller session, uh, yes. 45 minutes in the morning. And then I, I was thinking, okay, I will do one, one and a half hour in the afternoon. But then I see I was mentally not, not okay, okay to do one and a half hour. I stopped after one hour. And will you go I try, I try to do... Sorry, you're going on Swift? Ah, uh, just for the for the team uh, sponsors, uh, right? For for the rest, not. Uh, I saw the cookies on your Instagram. You yeah, you, you saw, you saw it, you saw it. Uh, she she tried to keep me motivated a little bit. Very good. Yeah, but now now we need to rise the game quite a lot. <laughs> you burn off the cookies. No, no, because it start to be, it start to be more and more uh, challenging to stay on the rollers uh, for a long time. Yes. So I think all we do a big cookie like this. Or, or we start to, or we need to get on the cake now, or some, or some pizzas, or, or something like this. <laughs> I have a few more questions, just short. I, I give you a, a topic and, and I ask you something, and you just answer the, the one or the other. So, if you wear socks, you have long socks or short socks? 
Middle. Middle. Yeah. Winter, long socks. Summer, the socks you cannot even see. Otherwise, the tail line on the beach is really bad. Very good. <laughs> Chemi cream, yes or no? No. Tattoos? You have tattoos? Yeah. Yes or no? Three. 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 Where, where are they? What are they? Two. These two. Uh, well, the yes. J is Jacopo and the G is Giovanni. And then I have a turtle on my back. And you have what on your back? A uh, turtle. Okay. Very good. Um, racing, you, you follow the power meter when you're racing or you go by feel? Both. Oh. Uh, let, let's say uh, for a rider like me on a, on a climb where I need to survive, I need to have a look at the power meter, of course, so don't go too much in the red zone. But when you need to go for gas, you need to go for gas. There is no power meter and no range. Yes, I can imagine. After the race, you have a massage or you jump in the ice bath? Uh, depends from situation, massage, ice bath, or ice bath massage. If the ice bath is already there and it's really warm, I go directly on the ice bath, massage, and then other ice bath. Very good. And for clothing, you wear short and jersey or you wear uh, a one piece? One piece. Shaving your legs, even off season, now uh, they are shaved? No, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like warm or cold, what do you prefer? Ah, for training, training in the warm is, is never bad. For the okay. racing, it's okay because it's bad weather. If it's bad weather, it's bad weather for everyone. Everyone. Um, the wind is your friend or your enemy? Oh, uh, it's a friend. Right. Sunday morning, you would lay in bed or you go early morning and you go for a ride? I always go early for a ride. Not early as you, but I yes. go early. <laughs> and tire pressure you go rather high or low high 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 tire pressure yeah we we managed a lot we worked a lot with lower slightly lower pressure and we really feel that's that's interesting especially going with wider tires that's something we have we have played around uh, yeah 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 there is big studies on this uh, yes. from us because of the roller resistance yeah it's, it's changing quite a lot yes changing uh, very quickly yes <laughs> Um, and this, your, your foot brake system, you have disc brakes or rim brakes? Ah, no, everyone is moving on disc. Disc now, okay, that's the new thing. Um, if you go for karaoke, is it Eros Ramazzotti or Andrea Bocelli? Bocelli. Bocelli, okay, we want to hear you now singing Bocelli. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, um, and drink, is it espresso or cappuccino? Depending on espresso. the Espresso, espresso. And espresso, and I tell you why, because when you go around the world to find a good cappuccino, it's really difficult. Okay, Cafe also Peloton fine, also fine. Fine. Cafe Peloton is pretty good. It's pretty mm. good, good, that I have to say. But it's, it's really difficult. And for food, is it pizza or pasta? If I can, if I can choose pizza. Okay, and is it gelato or tiramisu? Oh, 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 oh I cannot pick. <laughs> <Both. laughs> Very good. Okay. Then one last. When you go for holiday, you go mountains or you go to the beach? Uh, also that. Both. Both. And if you go to the beach, you wear speedo or you wear shorts? Shorts. Shorts. Good. Okay. That's good. That's Italian style. We, we let good. you go. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Hey, Matteo, we're at the end, and I think we, we broke a record. I think 61, 61 minutes over an hour. Sorry, it was only to play. Oh, it's no, pro no problem. Well, it was nice. It was nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, wish you I wish you hopefully soon to be back on the bike, and I, I'm lo looking forward to see you racing. And, and I think just for everyone watching you, you're really doing a lot for people. You, 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 as a racer, you're really exciting uh, to watch, and I really appreciate it, what you're doing. And grazie mille. Arrivederci. This is my Grazie. final. Uh, <laughs> Danke schön. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. No, thank you very much. And um, we have a, a guest on Friday. Uh, we have Rick Zabel uh, speaking to us, another German. So you, you're the yeah. Italian in between. I'm still uh, the only one. <laughs> we're looking forward to, to speak to Rick. Uh, and it's going to be at eight o'clock, not at seven. Uh, okay. We're going to speak eight o'clock in, in uh, Dubai. So if everyone wants to, to look. Good. Good. Uh, thank you very much uh, from me to, to have me here. And it was nice to have a chat. Hope everyone enjoyed this and uh, keep it up and hope to, to find uh, all you guys riding again in Dubai one day or another when we're going to be able to travel and ride outside again. Thank you.
We're looking forward to see you back in Dubai and you I and your so. wife, Claudia. I hope so. Thank I you. Hope so. Thanks for we the hope time. So. We all hope, especially the kids, they want to get back there. Okay, good. Water park. Water park was too fun. <laughs> good. That's great. That's great. Thank good. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Too. Thank Appreciate you. It. My See day. you, everyone. Ciao, Murphy. Ciao. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, great uh, speaking to Matteo. And as I said, uh, we're going to see you on Friday, uh, 8 o'clock, speaking to Rick Zabel. It's going to be interesting to speak to him about his career and how he was growing up with his father, Eric. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>